welcome to this um, which is on the Le leveling up and regeneration bill um, and addressing the question of whether the bill uh, will deliver more housing or not. We're just going to wait um, just for a few seconds whilst people log on. Um, so please do talk amongst yourselves just for half a minute or so. See how a number's doing. Okay, um, let's make a start. So uh, back to the beginning again. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. It's the latest in a series of our occasional webinars brought to you by Tan Legal um, with the assistance of Landmark Chambers. Um, today's session is all about the latest and biggest news by far in the planning world, uh, namely the LERB, um, but we're going to be looking at it uh, through a particular lens so as to ask and hopefully generate some answers as to whether the, deliver, the bill will deliver more housing or not. Um, as many commentators have said, isn't it a bill about housing after all? Um, so to help examine the LERB with that question in mind, um, today we all have obviously a most learned panel, so let me introduce them to you. Um, delighted that we're joined by Catherine Bentham, Planning Director at Barton um, Wilmore, now Stantec. Um, Catherine works across all types of development, but specialises in mixed use and residential schemes, so she's ideally placed uh, to help us with today's question. Hello, Catherine. Hello, thank you very much for the invite. Um, and moving on to Zach, Zach Simons from Landmark, who needs no introduction, I'm sure, um, a familiar face from many of our previous webinars and also from his excellent Planarax blog. Hi, Zach. Peter. Hello, hello. Hello. Um, and, uh, uh, and last, in terms of the main panel, but obviously far from least, Simon Ricketts, my brilliant fellow partner at Town Legal. Um, say hello, Simon. Oh. Thank you. Hello. 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 Great. Um, so that's the panel. Uh, but just when you thought it couldn't get any better, uh, we also have a very special guest. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by Simon Gallagher, Director of Planning at the um, Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, thanks for joining us, Simon. I know you're obviously uh, very busy at the moment, well, probably always, always very busy, but particularly busy at the moment with the LERB. Um, uh, hopefully you are going to be able to stay until the end uh, and give us the response uh, give us your response to the question. Um, without wishing to steal your thunder, just taking a wild stab in the dark, I'm guessing your answer is yes. Um, but we're, we're obviously all really, really keen to hear why your answer is yes. Hello, Simon. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, before we go any further, though, a few housekeeping points to note. Your, your uh, microphones are all automatically muted, so you don't need to adjust any of your own settings. Um, we, wo we won't be having an open Q&A session in this webinar because there's quite a lot to get through. Um, so unfortunately, there simply isn't time. Um, if you lose your connection at any point in the webinar, you can just rejoin the meeting by clicking on your original link. So. Uh, time to get on with the session. We have an hour. So uh, as is customary, uh, I'm going to tell you what we're going to say, then we're going to say it, and then we'll probably summarise what we've just said at the end, possibly with a few questions thrown in. Um, so what are we going to say? Catherine is going to cover the implications of the plan making aspects of the bill on housing delivery and housing numbers. Zach is going to cover the implications of the new presumption in favour of the plan. Uh, Simon R is going to cover national development management policies, uh, local design codes, amendments to planning commissions and sort of various other parts of the bill um, that are more self-contained, but also focused in, on sort of practical delivery issues like commencement and completion notices. And then finally, I'm going to spend a few minutes on um, our favourite uh, our favorite subject, which is, of course, development tax in the form of the new infrastructure levy. Um, and we have Simon G here. Um, and uh, Simon, you're going to uh, chime in on each of these issues as we go through them. Um, and if there is some time at the end, then we've got a few general overarching questions for you as to sort of next steps and that sort of thing. So um, on that basis, I think we better get going uh, to the actual meat of this webinar. Catherine, can I hand over to you to kick us off? You can indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate that when it comes to this topic, probably you'll be more interested to hear Simon uh, G's view than, than mine. So I will uh, inevitably make sure I leave sufficient time for Simon to talk about it as well. Um, I was given the topic or looked at the topic of, of housing numbers and local plans. Um, and, and obviously the first point on this is probably that the housing numbers um, is, is a notable omission from the bill. Um, we've obviously um, 
you know, looked previously or looked in the recent past um, in respect of amendments to the standard method. Um, and, and obviously that doesn't feature in the bill, although it obviously is, is a critical component um, when we look to other items in the bill in terms of uh, speeding up the local plan process. Um, Simon may well tell me otherwise, but I would assume that having attempted revisions to the standard method and generating phrases such as mutant algorithms, um, that given the incumbent government's um, current position, they may well have took the view that, that, that including that within the bill uh, may actually hinder rather than help the progress of the bill. But actually, uh, Simon, just bringing you in a little bit earlier than I thought, but, but is there a sort of specific reason why, why the housing numbers has been omitted from, from the bill? So traditionally we do housing policies and planning content in the national planning policy framework and supporting guidance rather than in primary legislation. Um, one of the weirdnesses of planning coming into it from uh, other areas has been that the, the primary legislation principally deals with the process and the arrangements for things and the what and the content tends to be handled through national planning policy. So that is the uh, a, a, a long-standing framework which we're not disturbing through the bill. Okay, thanks. Can, sorry, can I just then ask, do, can we expect something more on that, do you think? Then come well, what, we, what we've said is that we will publish a prospectus for a new national planning policy framework this spring alongside the bill so people can see um, what, we're, what we're meaning on some of the, the key issues and one, one or two of which we will come on to in the, conversa the context of this conversation. But I think one of the things we will need to do after the bill goes through is then turn that into a full new plas national planning policy framework. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so just then taking a look at plan making, I, I think the first thing to note is that obviously um, on face value, um, it appears to, to look at a sort of local level, but I think in reality, um, what has emerged from a, a sort of more continued read of the bill, I'd say is a possibly a greater deference to, to the national level, and Simon, you've just referenced the, um, the, the refocus of the MPPF as well. Um, at the national level, we have got a, um, a national development management policy um, coming, which is going to set out national level policies. I'm not going to talk too, too much on that because Simon Ricketts is going to come on and talk to you about that in a minute. Um, but, but my reading of the bill is that effectively what that's aimed at doing is linking into this wider rhetoric about um, speeding up the local plan process, um, feeding into the, um, the, the, the timescales which are, are now envisaged in the bill of um, a clear timescale for plan production, we're looking at a timescale of 30 months and one assumes that the, the logic behind that is that if we strip out the, the high level policies and don't replicate these in the plan that that might assist in speeding that up. Um, that, that the question that I would have on that, Simon, from my perspective, is that I do a lot of local plan examination work and I don't spend a huge amount of time talking about those policies. I spend a huge amount of time talking about the, the policies which are now sort of dealt, dealt with in the local plan, which is the sort of local level policies which are now going to be the remit of the plan. So just from, from your perspective, um, how, how do you envisage that, that stripping out the higher level policies, other than obviously making the plan slimmer, how do you envisage that that would then speed up the process? Well, look, Catherine, I'll probably have to go into some other aspects because it's not going to be yeah. that is not the only yeah. no, element no, that is designed to um, designed to speed up um, and simplify plan production. But let me go back two stages to get further forward, if I, I can do, and partly in an attempt to sort of answer the the question meter set us at the start about whether the bill, bill delivers more more homes. Um, the first bit I wanted to say was that it's con you should regard it as important that the bill's title is the leveling up and regeneration bill, not the planning for housing numbers bill or any other form of um, a form uh, of numbers. Those are the key topics that my Secretary of State wanted reflected in it. It's about levelling up and regeneration and those are the, the measures there and what the bill is largely about is creating a toolkit of things which local leaders can use to regenerate their communities. Um, and so there's some really important changes on compulsory purchase on which we published a further consultation today to exploring some of those which could be some more tools for regeneration around high street rental auctions, around new password development corporations. And so those, I think, are the, the, the core of where we see, see the sort of the, um, the, the development. 
and the regeneration coming through. I guess the the other bit though, and then just to sort of come back towards your question, Catherine, which I think is a great one, is that what we are seeing is the decline over recent years of plan making. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it for, for a lot of reasons being really hard for a lot of communities to get a plan in place. Um, and uh, plan coverage stands up, you know, it's, it's hard to make a precise estimate because some plans are maybe old, but some of the policies are up to date, but broadly only 40% of the country is covered by an up-to-date local plan, which means in the remaining uh, um, uh, areas, planning is either by application, um, uh, which gives very little certainty for either the investors or the community, or by appeal, um, where, there is even less certainty, and there's probably some some uh, some greater consternation in the communities. And so, what this bill is about is about giving a real serious go at getting plan making in there. You know, what our vision, and this is where I really do get to answering your question eventually, uh, Catherine, is, is what what if we could strip plans right back to the essentials of what a plan should do about where they map a, uh, an area, show what's possible and what's, uh, what's not possible in different places, overlay the policies on them. What if we use the power of new tech to make those much more interactive documents? Could that make something that is vastly more accessible, more interesting to communities and to be, be um, simpler for um, for everybody to engage with and therefore help in focus the discussion onto exactly those precise questions that you you describe Catherine which are in inevitably right at the heart of uh, heart of heart of plan ma making if we can you know we've seen too much of local plans which have become 500 page pdf files in there which for a small investor or even a you know, uh, consultant or lawyer with uh, with an expertise in looking at these, it's pretty hard to find out what is actually possible in which places. Can we get something which is strips it back to the core? Is what we're trying to do, rather than um, rather than get, uh, you know, sort of tolerate this this um, expansion of plans, and thereby reduce the cost and increase the benefits for communities for getting a plan in place. And the, one of the key things we've done in, in uh, we're proposing is to get rid of the five-year land supply test for the first five years of a plan. So there's a real active benefit for the local community in getting a plan in place. And I think that mix, what we're trying to do is a few sort of tweaks that increase the incentives to do there and a bit more of the, the, the consequences if you don't get plans in place. Um, and that, it, I theory should just nudge this so that we're getting more plans in place and so that the the you know relative to a counterfactual which sees this decline in plan making we think we should be adding more plans and we know more plans means sort of homes that um that communities buy into thanks and I think from from my perspective I'd say I don't know many planning practitioners who wouldn't support a more plan a more plan led system really um I think uh, and I was quite encouraged by the use of your word visionary then and I really hope that that by stripping back the planning system we might get something which is a little bit more visionary because what I from personal experience I would say what I tend to find is that plans can often read as a little bit defensive and a little bit about control rather than um rather than sort of growth and, embr and embracing opportunities really so if that's what comes out of it then I would say okay that's a, a a good thing really um in terms of um yeah I mean it just just you know in terms of obviously a couple of those sort of big ticket items on there obviously removal of, of duty to cooperate and and what that is replaced with what actually a, a sort of flexible what was it flexible alignment test what that actually means in practice and you actually sort of used the phrase there I think you were talking about um a few tweaks um to sort of um incentivize plan production I think one of the one of the concerns that that I think a few people have had including myself is that yes we can see the incentives but actually sometimes you need the, the sort of the sticks as well to kind of um you know push these things along um because for some authorities for example you know getting rid of a five-year housing land supply well if you're primarily green belt it doesn't really make the five-year housing lens, but it you know bears little uh, sort of impact on you really. So it's kind of just you know I, I, I don't know many people who would say that that duty to cooperate probably needs a revamp in some form. But on the plus side, it does um, it does flush out some of the the, the cooperation points um, into a public arena quite early on. And it's kind of understanding what a, what a flexible alignment test might or you know how that might manifest itself and actually what effect that will have really. 
Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting question. It links actually back to your first first point about the, the connections between the, the wonderful world of policy and law. Mm. Um, at the moment, the duty to cooperate being a statutory test, it's only a pass fail. Um, yeah. And it's really hard for local authorities who get into a problem on duty to cooperate matters at um, at examination to fix it. Um, now, what we're proposing to do is take that out of law, and the the bill has the effect of of doing so. Incidentally, one of the things I got bogged down with was couldn't find where it had been repealed and spent ages trying to hunt that, hunt that down it has it, it it does do it it does work i've gone through it but it took me about two days to find find my way through that um but to put some kind of more policy test in there which would enable it to be more like you know what the other tests of soundness of how it fits uh, in and aligns with um with neighboring areas where there are uh, where there are plans i think this is one of the things that we're going to have to put out some mm -hmm. some thoughts on as part of what I've described as our prospectus um, over the next couple of months. I think you know there's there's lots of lots of ideas for how we can do this. I think the key thing is it needs to be a bit more flexible so that it can be fixed in examination. Whereas what we're finding at the moment is that planning inspectors, you know, if you fail the duty to cooperate, you know, you, your options are only to withdraw the plan or not. Um, whereas if we can get something which is a bit more judgment based there's a bit more um fixed uh, uh, a bit more uh, a bit more focused on key things like you know if somebody is building a a new uh, new settlement right next to one local authority's boundary which is dependent critically on a bit of infrastructure that stretches over the other the other one and that isn't provided for in the neighboring plan then clearly you've got a bit of an alignment issue yeah. but how how far we go one for the, one for one for development i think okay thanks um and i'm mindful of the time so I'll, I'll hand over to zach in a moment but just a couple of other sort of very quick thoughts i think from my perspective um the idea of gateway provisions i think it's a good thing i think you know, the the, more, the earlier you can get advice um, and if it's good advice then obviously um that, that's never a bad thing um Local plan commissioners. Um, again, I, I guess it's, it's how it's how it's how that's used and, and, and when that's used and actually the impact that might not have. Um, a really boring planning geeky one, but I did see about a consolidated proposals map. That would be really 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 helpful. Thank you. Um, and if you can print extracts of it or save extracts, that would be even better. Um, but I think you know probably coming to the, the the question, and I appreciate you might address this question sort of towards the end, Simon. But I think the question, you know, from my perspective about Will it deliver more housing? Um, I'd, lo I'd love to say yes, and I really don't. And I don't underestimate the task or you know of those whose job it is to produce this. Um, I think you know I, I do have some concerns about um, about the extent to which it will speed up plan making. I fully support plan making as a process, but I, I really do. I have some concerns, you know, from my perspective, and and that might come out in the, the, the wash in terms of when when more detail comes out, or it might come out when when we get you know the new version of the MPPF. Um, I'm just slightly worried as to kind of how the housing number fits into it um, and then actually how we, we do go about uh, speeding up the system and and you know probably the the really difficult ones um, you know it's obviously the the you know any political political intervention and I'm sure Simon uh, Ricketts will talk about this when we come on to the sort of national side of it but you know how to deal with with that when you know we've got a general election coming up in in a couple of years again um, and, and you know the, the sort of intertwining really of, of politics and planning so I'd love to say yes um, it probably requires you know a, a bit more kind of detail to come out before I can you know before I can be a bit more positive unfortunately. Well, well, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's fair. And I wouldn't expect you to say anything other. The thing I'd say is is that as a good um, uh, sort of uh, policy making, you've got to beat your counterfactual, and that's why I think it is important. You know, one too much of the problem with planning is comparing things to how it was in a, a year uh, or a, or a, at a particular point of time. Does it be improve relative to the counterfactual? And I think I think there, there's something there, and I think there is certainly something for the plan making system as a least worst of all possible ways of doing this. Because I think you know planning by application has real costs to smaller developers. Planning by um, by contested appeal has real costs for communities. So I think it behooves all of us involved in planning to have a go at seeing whether we can come up with a simpler and better way of planning. And you know one of the virtues of what we've done with the bill of creating quite much a framework is to sort of say instead of let's do this as questions of me well what's how are we all going to get in as professionals involved in this world in designing something which actually 
does work and does do some of this and which actually helps helps our um the the poor local authority and uh, political and uh, official staff to wait, work through this so i think that's the that's the task for us for the next phase thanks uh Mita, can i um i think probably dealt with my section now if i hand over to i think it's zach who's next Thanks, Catherine and Simon. Thanks. That was really good, uh, really good discussion to, to kick us off. And thanks, Catherine, really, um, you know, incisive um, and uh, and really sort of got us off to a good start in terms of the main issues in that subject area. Um, before I do hand over to Zach, Simon G, um, did I know you've obviously you've had an opportunity there to talk about the plan making side of things. Were there any general other sort of general overarching comments that you wanted to make before we move on? I, I think I've made them in the course of that by not answering Catherine's question <laughs> very well at the outset and by going backwards. Um, I've been well trained by my bosses. <laughs> OK, um, great. Um, uh, thanks very much, Simon. In that case, uh, Zach, time to hand over to you to give us some thoughts on the implications of the um, new presumption in favour of the plan um, and what implications that might have for housing delivery. Thank you, me too. Well, it follows on very neatly from that, the, the answers that Simon was just giving, really, because we all know, or we think we know anyway, that we're working in a system which is plan led, quote unquote. In fact, that the current version of the MPPF tells us that our system is not only a little bit plan led, it is genuinely plan led. It's the word that's used. So, you know, that sounds important. But what does plan led actually mean? Um, it sounds simple enough. You make a plan, you follow the plan. But of course, there's a bit more to it than that. And to understand why the change that's proposed in LERB matters, I think we need to understand the current state of the law, if you like, and what it does and doesn't say. Uh, all the way back, very briefly, but all the way back to the 1947 Act, which passed under Clem Attlee's government, created the basic building blocks for the modern planning system, and told us in Section 14 of that Act that in dealing with any planning applications, the authorities shall have regard to the provisions of the plan so far as material thereto, we don't get enough drafting like that anymore, Simon. So far as material there too, and to any other mater material considerations. And as we know, that clause in a slightly modernised form, but anyway, the substance of that clause has gone the distance and we get the same thing in Section 70 of the current uh, Act, the 1990 Act, which tells us that, that authorities have to have regard to the provisions of the development plan so far as material and to lots of other things too, including other material considerations. So the key thing about those absolutely foundational provisions for our planning system which have been around as long as we've had a planning system is, is that they make it necessary to consider the plan but they do not give any legal primacy to doing what the plan says section 70 of the 1990 act doesn't say follow where the plan leads it just says you've got to think about the plan and you've also got to think about a number of other things too you've got to reach a balance that's step one uh, step two is section 26 of the planning and compensation act 1991 which starts, if you like, to tilt the balance in favour of the plan. This is where we get what you might call a plan-led system, which turns into a presumption in favour of the plan. Um, you should follow where the plan leads in a nutshell, unless there's a good reason not to. And the language is where in making any determination under the Planning Act's regard is to be had to the plan, the, determined should be, the determination should be made in accordance with the plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. That's a big step. Uh, over and above section 70 of the 1990 Act. And that legal presumption in favour of the planet, as we know, has been the bedrock of development management in England for over 30 years, and it's made its way into section 38.6 of the 2004 Act, which is the section that those of us in, engaged in this sort of job are dealing with day in, day out. So that's the law. What does it actually mean? Loads of cases over 30 years have considered that language. The classic text probably remains the House of Lords decision on the Scottish equivalent of those provisions in the Edinburgh City Council case in 1997. Um, and from that case and the legions of others that have followed it, the courts have distilled a few key principles about this Section 38.6 uh, duty. The, the effect of Section 38.6 is to give priority to the plan, so it, it creates a presumption in favour of the plan, and to uh, follow that presumption, normally decision makers need to decide whether or not an application or an appeal scheme accords with the plan read as a whole, doesn't mean adhering to every single policy in a plan, policies may pull in different directions, the courts have told us. But in any event, there's a presumption, but presumptions can be rebutted. The courts have told us that, of course, you know, plans become outdated. They might become superseded by more, more recent guidance, national policy or whatever. 
which means that Lord Clyde said way back in the Edinburgh case, this presumption is not a mechanical preference for the plan. There remains a valuable element of flexibility, or as Lord Hope put it in that Edinburgh case, the plan doesn't have absolute authority that the, the LPA need not slavishly adhere to it, is the phrase he used. And in the end, this decision on where the balance lies between the plan and other material considerations, how much weight to give all of these ingredients in, in the balance, is a question of judgment for the decision maker. It's not prescribed by the, by the statute or anywhere else. So albeit we start with the plan under Section 38.6, it's no part of the law at the moment that you have to give the plan more weight than anything else, other considerations in the balance. All of that's a question of judgment for decision makers. And that's telling you what you all already know. But that, that's the law that we have today. So what does LERB do about this? Well, for England, the proposal is to insert a new section 38.5a and 5b, 5c. All of that will, will replace section 38.6 for, for English applications. And under this balance, decisions must be made in accordance with the development plan and any national development management policies. See Simon Ricketts' talk in a few minutes' time. Unless material considerations strongly indicate otherwise. And also, if to any extent the, the development plan conflicts with the national development management policy, you resolve the conflict in favour of the national policy. Now, that changes the law, I think, or proposes to change the law in at least two really um, significant ways. Firstly, now we'd, we'd have that the, the core requirement is to take the determination in accordance with national policy first or national DM policy first. And then after that, so long as there's no conflict with national policy, the development plan. And as I say, Simon Ricketts is going to comment on those national development management policies in a mo, so I won't go into what they might comprise. But what we should note is for, for all these years, documents like the MPPF and its, and its many, many predecessors have at least in theory been subsidiary to the statutory development plan. They aren't in charge in a plan-led world, even though slightly oddly, they purport to be able to render development plans out of date. But that legal relationship would change under the bill national policies actually come first or those which are designated as national dm policies um, now much will depend on what those policies say obviously but it seems to me that, that that creates the legal infrastructure for a pretty significant shift away from not towards a system that you might describe as plan led at least if by plan led you mean locally plan led because of this um, extra layer of national policies but I think that this is a shift that, depending on what the policies the Secretary of State decides to make national DM policies, TBD, it could, it could be a real vehicle to deliver more housing. More on that in a couple of minutes. Um, and second, the other really important um, proposed change in the law is that uh, for now for material considerations to indicate taking a decision other than that which accords with the plan, they'd have to strongly indicate um, otherwise, strongly indicate taking a decision otherwise than that which the plan would indicate strongly. And this is the strengthened emphasis on the plan led approach that was promised actually back in the 2020 white paper. We all know the problem, I think, in, in my own practice, so many of my appeal cases involve uh, refusals of planning permission against officers advice on allocated sites. When councils have spent so much time and money producing a plan in the first place, seeing its provisions flouted can be frustrating it can be expensive and many of my clients throw their hands up in despair so so often the implication is at least to cynics out there that our system can be led as much by local politics as local plans so will that word strongly make a difference will it uh, on our topic of today lead to more houses being built i think i think at the local level well, I'm sorry to say this, as, because as Catherine does, I would very much like to see a plan making system delivering lots more um, homes. My sense is that the local level, just focusing on 38.5 and the proposed changes, we're unlikely to see much of a difference. We already have a presumption in favour of the plan. Adding an adverb like strongly to that presumption is in my own just personal view. It's unlikely to make much of a difference when it comes to winning the hearts and minds of local councillors for schemes which may, for whatever reason, be difficult or, or unpopular. And in the end, inevitably, the courts will tell us that striking the balance between the plan and other material considerations is a planning judgment exercise, whether that word strongly is there or not. And so I don't see much sort of legal ammunition to persuade decision makers to you know, do the right thing. Um, I do see that on appeal, inspectors would, you would hope, focus in on the wording of that test and apply it properly. But in my experience, 
they're already giving more than enough weight to development plans when those plans are recently adopted and up to date. The really thorny issues on weighing development plan policies on appeal tend to come when plans are out of date. As Simon said, that's that's a quite a common occurrence around the country. But in those circumstances, the, the strength built into this new presumption will start to recede anyway. But most fundamentally, um, a presumption in favour of the development plan only works if councils can be persuaded, incentivised, as Catherine and Simon were just talking about, regularly to uh, adopt up-to-date plans and further to that can be persuaded to undertake the strategic spatial planning with neighbours, um, which is currently only uh, optional, not, not mandatory in the bill, but, but could, I think, be an engine of really important growth. It treads slightly outside the remit of my talk. It goes back to what Catherine was just talking about with Simon, but I think the real answer um, it, to, to the question is, is that more houses requires councils to adopt more plans, essentially simplistic, but I think, you know, fair enough. So the real test um, against which those like uh, me work in my world will be judging LERB and its proposals is whether it shifts the ground enough to get those plans pushed through in order to reverse what Simon referred to as a, as a decline in decision making, um, in plan making. And that's all I wanted to say in my in my 10 minute spiel. Um, but Simon, I, don't, I, I think I'm to pass to you now to see whether or not there's anything you'd like to say by way of um, commenting on what I've said. Zach, like I'd never, never dare dispute your um, your uh, le legal uh, explanations. There, I think you've you've captured the issues very well. So, I think the bit I just want to do, and Zach, you hinted at this, but let, let me just do, uh, do a bit more on this. Is the the history and where we came from? The 2020 white paper really proposed that the 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 plan was absolutely binding. So the the idea there was you would fix land categorizations, and those land uses would be fixed in the plan and you could not depart from them and we heard quite a lot of powerful representations on many topics um, in response to that white paper but um, one of which was that you need a little bit more flexibility in the system and what we've been trying to do is balance that need for a bit of flexibility because stuff happens with the the sort of yeah, but actually there was a reason why we were interested in giving more weight to plans, which is the certainty that that gives to investors to um, uh, and to and particularly to smaller developers is really important. So this is a, a way we think we can dial up the certainty working within the existing framework that as you um, as you have described it, um, you know, th there is a bit of question about the weight of an adverb um, and I predict there will be a, a degree of interest in that um, but e equally one of the things we were keen to do is evolve uh, the the English planning system here and get something with a framework that we can get there but one of the things that we have noticed is that for local politicians one of the you've got to show there's some real gain to them to getting a plan in place and be, this confidence that decisions will be taken in line with that plan actually is one of the, uh, by, by inspectors, is one of the things which dials up the expectations and the incentives on them. And and I think it's quite it's quite material. I'm really pleased that you finished off by saying that one of the tests of this is whether we can get more plans in place, because I think that is sort of the, the game. You know, more plans than what? Whether is it more plans than the declining counterfactual that I portrayed at the start I think yes uh, but it, how far much further we can go um, is a is a real real test and there is a limited amount that we can achieve from government but our job is to create the framework which enables the the democratically elected councillors to to take this forward within their own areas I think Simon that the that's really interesting and if there was one sort of provision in the current MPPF that I think might as to be the key to unlocking the door to you know for greater incentives to adopt plans it, it tallies with something that Catherine was saying earlier on it's probably footnote seven I think to into paragraph 11 of the current framework which is the footnote that as essentially it's only a footnote only a footnote but of course a, a very very important bit of policy that has the effect of disapplying what would otherwise be the consequences of failing to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply um, in you know in areas where lots of particular environmental policy for, uh, policies of protection um, pertain and of course there's very good reasons why you might want to do something like that but as Catherine said I think the real risk that I think some of us see in lots of very well publicized authority areas 
not just in the southeast, but there are lots of high profile examples in the southeast, all metropolitan greenbelt authorities, um, is, is that for, the, for such authorities, which are covered by, you know, in some cases, 80, 90 percent plus greenbelt, the, the, the policy you referred to earlier of, of um, reducing the need in the first five years of a, of a new pl plan to, um, to, to, to demonstrate a five year housing land supply, doesn't have the teeth that it would otherwise have elsewhere and so in such authority areas and those are the ones which have really struggled many of them have really struggled to take plans forward one casts around for that we need other incentives if you like to to get to get to get those the, those authorities planning or really for them for the local politicians to see the benefits i suspect of plan making in those areas but i am definitely trespassing on things that Catherine's already covered so Shut up now. <laughs> but you win bonus points for using the LERB acronym. I was disappointed. I, I, I tried to call this the bill for levelling up and regeneration of blur because I'd had a whole load of Britpop puns in Absolutely. there, but I've lost I've lost that one. So it's uh, a great segue to Simon Ricketts, I suspect, just puns on the name on the name of the bill. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Zach and, and Simon. Um, Zach, I do love the fact that you had a timer on and that we got to hear it go off. Um, possibly also slightly relieved, slightly relieved because when you started at the 1947 Act, I was wondering how many bits of we brought us up to date. A good history lesson in planning it would have been, but I think we've got some <laughs> other things to cover. Um, but now it is definitely over to Simon to Simon Ricketts. Um, you're going to cover things like uh, the National Development management policies and design codes and other practical useful parts of the bill yeah no thank you Mita and um no there's no um lerb puns I'm afraid uh and before, before I get into the uh, sorry to disappoint uh before I get into the the sort of um the main development management aspects that I wanted to talk about I wanted to step back and it chimes very much with what we've been talking about so far because um the changes to that are proposed to development management procedures are, 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 in my view, useful, but they're relatively limited. And, and the most important things that are uh, going to have an impact um, are in two categories, to my mind. First of all, <laughs> getting the changes to plan making right, because um, if your plan isn't in, if your scheme isn't in the plan, if it isn't consistent with national development management policies and local design codes, we haven't talked about local design codes yet, uh, you, you're really going to be pushing water uphill with your scheme. Whereas if you're consistent with uh, the local plan, the national development management policies, local design codes, then you're going to have a much smoother, smoother ride. Um, and, and I think that's really the, at the heart of all of this. But secondly, as ever, it's all about the money. And so it's all about on one one side of the coin it's about scheme viability preserving scheme viability making sure the infrastructure levy works and on the other side of the coin it's about you know the resources that are needed to make the system work and higher application fees um may help but obviously they're not um ring fenced as i understand so uh, i only wanted to touch on um a few proposals within the bill in my um few minutes the f first of all um, yes, this new definition of national development management policy that's introduced, it will be new um, section 8ZA of the 2004 Act, um, and uh, it's really <laughs> a policy which the Secretary of State des designates as a national development management policy, so the usual sort of circular uh, d definition which concerns the development or use of land in England. And you know we expect that um, uh, the national development management policies will set out national policies on issues that apply in most uh, local authorities and that you commonly see in all local authority uh, uh, plans with variations on wording in terms of heritage protection, policies relating to the green belt, et cetera. And it would be great to strip all of those out and have consistency. Um, uh, and uh, as we've heard, um, your DM policies uh, at a national level will be given the same weight as development plans, so we need to be taken fully into account in decision making. Um, so um, to an extent, uh, maybe a limited extent, as, as you know, Catherine alludes to, it will speed up local plan processes, it will certainly make local plans shorter, it, it will also enable a more consistent approach to policy interpretation because we've all 
we've all scratched our heads over endless permutations of these basically bog standard policies. But, but, but what I'm, I'm a bit uncertain about is where the dividing line is between um, development plan, development management policies that are going to be dealt with at a national level and those which really need to remain either at a local level or at in London, the London plan level. Because I, I can see that it will be straightforward to have policy tests for heritage, flooding, green belt, um, uh, various other environmental issues, which are basically replicating what's already in the MPPF um, by way of tests. But, but then when you look at your typical DM policies in a local plan, what about housing sizes, uh, tenure types, um, you know, your policies on amalgamation and subdivision of dwellings, um, the approach to loss of housing to commercial uses, um, you know, how much outdoor space needs to be provided with housing, play space, etc. Uh, and I, what I see is there's probably going to be a dividing line between um, what goes in national development management policies and what goes in local design codes. And I think there could be a bit of a battleground here where, or a turf war, because you know, a local authority or whoever is preparing a local design code probably wants to control a lot of that. Um, um, so, so where the design, where the dividing line is, uh, and where the government starts in terms of the consultation over the, um, the, the the national policies, I think is going to be really important and 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 interesting. Uh, the, the second thing I wanted to talk about was uh, amendments to planning permission. Um, I mean, given that planning application processes for large schemes are not going to be significantly shortened under the new system, um, it's important that there is a workable process for amending planning permissions. You know, we've currently got section 96A, section 73. It was interesting to me that Joanna Averley in her newsletter last week to chief planners specifically warned of the need for amendment of many permissions due to the requirements of the new building regulations and that's just an example of the fact that it's routine to need to keep permissions up to date and to be able to amend them um, we've had clouds of uncertainty in recent years and additional complexity as a result of court rulings the finney case and the hillside um, case. Now, it's, it's, it's really welcome that there's a provision in the bill which essentially deals with Finney, which said that you couldn't make a Section 73 application where what you're proposing uh, amounts will, will necessitate an amendment to the description of development on the face of the permission. And there's going to be a new um, procedure which allows you to make um, non-substantial changes to a permission. Uh, including to um, the descriptor of development. Um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how non-substantial changes is interpreted, um, but it does give uh, some additional flexibility. I'd love to have seen the provisions go further, as Simon knows, and to, to tackle Hillside, but we're just going to have to cross our fingers when um, the Supreme Court considers that issue um, at the beginning of July. Um, and the third and final um, thing I just wanted to touch on in my limited time was um, uh, commencement notices um, uh, are a new, uh, a, a, a new procedure um, in that the bill um, indicates or well, provides that uh, developers will need to provide commencement serve commencement notices on the local authority um, before starting development and that will they will need to include um, information which will include not just the intended commencement date of the development but the proposed you know it can include the proposed delivery rate of the scheme in terms of you know how many numbers of dwellings are going to come forward um you know uh, over e e each year and the date on which other uh, development is expected to be substantially completed and that that's going to be you know i can see very useful for many purposes but but, uh, but when you put it together with provisions that make um completion notices more straightforward for authorities to um to serve on um owners um uh without any uh, approval process um, involving the Secretary of State where the owner objects to the completion notice. Um, I, I, I do think, you know, 
dependent on what um, policy guidance comes through, you know, we are moving more towards use it or lose it. Um, when it comes to whether that will deliver more housing, uh, it may well do, but I think it will bring uh, differing influences into the planning process and cause some applicants perhaps to, you know, question whether they should be bringing forward applications, you know, within a particular time scale or, or, or whatever. Uh, I think there hasn't been as much commentary yet as I would have expected on the extent to which, um, uh you know these provisions add up to um something which is really trying to move the dial in terms of encouraging not just issue of permission but but delivery but i think i'll end it there so that um simon can put me right on what i've said but uh, any thoughts simon I, again wouldn't wouldn't differ, uh, have the temerity to put, try and put you right on that no i think that that's where you'd i think on national development management policies we understand that we have created the framework for this and we need to set out in a bit more detail how these might work there is a proper discussion to be had here about the boundaries of local freedoms and flexibilities and efficient and sensible central standardization you know there are some things some of which were the ones you described Simon where you know we what we see is a bit similar story to you that there's a lot of time wasted at examination with sort of minute textual changes to policies to try and bring them into a line with with a national policy you know let's not waste waste that bit of time but how far that wants to go i think that's a productive space um for those on this sort of call to be started to think about where is the right space what are the practical practical spaces we could we could do to draw the line um and then uh, some just to pick your point on the commencement and completion notices i agree this hasn't had much um much attention so there is a debate in our world about build out and slow build out of permissions which whether or not it's true in the real world is a real issue for a lot of councillors and i've listened to a lot of them di discussing how much of a practical problem this this is if they want to um sort of win popular support for development for the next period they need to show that things are actually happening this this period and so this is designed to give them more tools to um help uh, uh, to support uh, to to support delivery in their areas and i think it's a further reminder that we're trying to get here is planning to be a very much an active tool not just a passive approach to sort of well permission and that's it it's a positively shape the place positively lead the regeneration positively manage the 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 development process and they put a bit more of the control back into the the council uh, as place shapers in this process great thanks simon and simon um I'm conscious of time. Um, we don't seem to have very much time left. Uh, and I would imagine that there are probably a few people breathing a huge sigh of relief because our last topic is the infrastructure levy. Um, so I'll do my best to get through the uh, um, um, a, a, a bit of um, discussion on the uh, infrastructure levy as quickly as possible. And hopefully we will still have uh, a couple of minutes at the end to come back to some general questions to pose them to Simon in terms of the sort of next steps um, parts of, of this whole process. Um, so final area that we're going to focus on, as I say, is the new infrastructure levy, so the ill, which has proposed to replace SIL in England. Um, so if I just spend a few minutes uh, covering what that looks like so far as we know to date, um, before moving on to um, any potential consequences or impacts in terms of housing delivery. Um, so the bill, of course, sets out a structure for the primary legislation, and that structure is very similar to the primary legislation that we already have um, for SIL, but there are some noteworthy differences. Um, and in short, uh, the bill retains a high level of flexibility in terms of um, pr primary legislation, I suppose. Uh, you know, quite similar to SIL, if it ain't broke, don't, you know, if it ain't broke, then no need to fix it. Um, as with SIL, though, the detailed construction of a levy is going to be set out in proposed uh, regulations, and obviously we don't have those yet. Uh, you therefore need to look at the policy paper that was issued alongside the bill uh, in order to get some sense, I suppose, um, of, of, of what that secondary legislation might look like. 
So a quick summary of some important points, which you can elicit from both the bill and the policy paper together. Um, it's going to be mandatory for all local authorities to charge ill. It's not optional, um, as it currently is with SIL. Uh, it's going to apply to changes of use, not just development um, of new or existing buildings, or it certainly can. Um, and remember the fact that SIL doesn't apply to changes of use and the fact that it didn't and doesn't was an important and sort of vaunted part of its design originally. Um, it's going to be based on uh, rates set out in the charging schedule, like SIL, uh, but those rates can be based on a percentage of the final gross development value of development, as opposed to you know, this current SIL uh, basis, which is a net increase in floor space, and there's going to be a minimum threshold under which it won't be charged. When will the levy be payable, however, and that's not yet entirely clear, and, and Simon, perhaps you can come back to this point in a minute. Um, the intention seems to be that the levy will be calculated on the basis of the GDV at sale, or presumably at some other point, if you're not selling, and then what happens there, BTR developments, for example, um, and so payable at that point. Um, but the bill seems to allow for payments on account, so that seems to suggest that there may be an intention to allow for earlier payment with balancing payments, perhaps at the end. Um, what can it be applied to? Well, it can be collected and applied to um, infrastructure. Um, very broad definition. We have that already, I suppose. But it's, you know, it's, it's very clear that the intention is that it's going to be um, used for delivery of affordable housing. And that's probably one of the most significant differences. Um, and alongside that, there's a, a sort of a, a proposed right to require, I think, developers to provide affordable housing on their sites in lieu of paying the cash levy. So an in-kind approach to life. Again, that's not new. It's in it's in the SIL reg. So, you know, there is some experience and legislation um, to draw on there. And then finally, alongside that, what we've got is that Section 106 agreements are going to be scaled back significantly um, and they're only going to be used uh, for large and complex developments. So I think it's binary, which is actually really helpful. Either your Section 106 or your levy, you're not both. Great. Um, but obviously you need to keep Section 106 agreements, or at least that's been recognised because we need it for on-site infrastructure, a game where that has a, a broad meaning, obviously. Um, so implications uh, on housing delivery, well, that seems to me to be a very difficult question to answer on the basis of the detail that we've got at the moment. Um, they're just, uh, th there are too many details that just aren't sufficiently clear, I suppose. C could it have a significant impact? Well, the answer is probably yes. Um, but I think um, it's likely that we're going to find it difficult to disentangle the impact of the levy from all the various other things that are going on, whether it's taxes or new planning requirements or, or, or whatever, as we go through all these other changes. Um, so, uh, so I think in terms of the infrastructure levy, it's probably more helpful to, to, to focus on the sorts of things that perhaps uh, will really matter um, in terms of fleshing out the actual sort of detailed structure um, of the framework under the regulations. And so, um, uh, so just a couple of headline, well, a couple, a few headline points, rate setting, rate setting, rate setting, rate setting, going to be hugely important. Um, you know, will we have a wider variety of rates? Um, what's the minimum threshold going to be? How all, How is all of this going to be set? How will the inevitably broad test of viability, which we already have under SIL actually, um, across an area is going, how is that going to be applied and so on? Um, and how is the rate setting going to be affected by rolling affordable housing into what the levy can be applied to? Um, you know, uh, sorry, Simon, I know you've heard me say this multiple times already, but the stakes are really high if you roll affordable housing into the mix. Rate settings are now much more risky. It's much more important. Rates are going to have to be significantly higher. Um, and there's going to have to be a lot of discussion over what the costs of providing affordable housing are in order to make all of this work. Um, and similarly, if everything that would ordinarily, well, everything, but a lot of things that would ordinarily be paid for by way of contribution under Section 106 agreements are also going to be swept into the levy pot, again, you're ratcheting up the risk even more. Um, calculation and timing of payment is another area, I think, which is also crucial, just touched on that. Um, I mean, one thing that seems to be being implied about SIL is that it isn't particularly certain when actually I think that's one of the things it does have going for it. Um, you know, we we know what we know that when it's going to be paid, we know um, the basis on which it's going to be, be calculated. I think the trick with ill is going to be ensuring that uncertainty as to the amount and when quantum and liability crystallizes for the purposes of the ill um, isn't increased or introduced in terms of uh, you know, fleshing out its detailed design and, you know, how does it work with things like multi-phase development and the timing of calculation and payment of multi-phase development and um, whether the level of liability 
you know, can affect later phases and whether they're delivered at all. Um, I mean, there are various other practical questions to, that, 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 that need to be addressed, but, you know, I'm sure that that will come out in, in the wash. Um, quick point about delivery of infrastructure. Research has shown that many authorities haven't been very good at spending SIL monies. So if they're collecting more for more things, um, again, surely there should be an increased emphasis on, on um, spending that money on local authorities delivering with that funding. Um, and, you know, I would I personally would like to see something more on that, um, you know, in, in whatever form it comes forward. I'm not sure that the legislation so far in terms of producing infrastructure delivery plans, etc., um, really has much in the way of teeth and doesn't seem to um, have much impact in that uh, in that sense. Um, so to finish where I started in terms of conclusions, I don't think it's possible to say uh, whether the ill will impact on housing delivery, because I think uh, there isn't enough detail but I do think the implications are much wider um, than that as an issue I mean even setting aside the fact that the ill will have the potential to affect all development not just housing it's all development um, you know the implications are broad in the sense that local authorities are going to be expended uh, expected to fund more from the pot including affordable housing um, and if the rates aren't set in a sustainable way then they could broadly speaking end up with less not more than they currently get um, and there could be differential impacts on different types of development and different types of developer which I think is the last thing perhaps that the government's intending so uh, just in the in the last few minutes then Simon um, uh, perhaps you could come back on, on one or two of those questions yeah, thank you, Mita, and a, a fantastic overview of um, something quite complicated in very little time. Look, um, this is one of the bits of the, the bill which is genuinely new and quite big, replacing Section 106 and SIL, and it, I view it, uh, Mita, much less as replacing SIL, as replacing Section 106 and SIL for all but the largest developers and that's the developments, and that's why I don't think there's the problem with affordable housing, because we manage that um, through Section 106 at the moment and the revealed experiences, that's where um, where most of the, the Section 106 goes to. Um, there, you're right, there is a lot um, a lot of detail and we've promised a further consultation on that and my guess is there'll be a series of these for uh, for, for us to work th these things through um just a couple of points though i think um you know you asked the question about is it payable at sale or uh, given uh, or given the provisions in the bill for advance payments um i think what we're envisaging has always been at sale because that's that's the concept behind this. It move, moves away from forward funding by um, by the uh, by the private sector. But what we need may need is some of those advanced funding payments for multi-phase developments, exactly as you describe. So that's a bit of what what's in there. Um, I think the issue is less the rates than the thresholds. I think setting the thresholds right per development. What is the build cost allowance? And then you you know once you've dealt with that, then it the rates on top of it are are much more uh, much less uh, impactful on on viability uh, and one of the virtues of this and why I, i'm a bit more optimistic on you on the on the 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 homes is that you know the key bit here is is two things one is removing the negotiation period that happens in a section 106 into a more of a sort of right this is all fixed um uh, it, it, it's it's uh, it's um uh, it's set at the at the outset and so you move that out from the process and that enables you to bring forward the delivery of homes and um, the second bit is the the setting the uh, the the base of the tax on the um the gdv rather than a prescribed pound per floor uh, uh, space which means that some of those increases in value and decreases as a result of market fluctuations are shared fairly between developers and um and communities without the sort of haggle and renegotiation process that has to happen under the current system so i think you've got a much more responsive model uh here but look you meta you've identified all the great questions that we need to do what we have said is we will publish a further consultation again you know and there's a bit of a risk that this gets a be a game of almost sort of like 20 questions of the government in that we put out a consultation and people sort of say oh, but you haven't answered this question and you need to do this bit of detail we 
evolve our policy thinking in stages and in waves and it will get there in the end your help in helping us shape that your help in engaging us and saying yeah that bit works that bit's not quite right this bit you'll need to do slightly differently that way you're going to be too complicated you're worrying about the wrong thing that is the sort of engagement we'll want and we'll be, we'll begin that process um as soon as i can get um a um consultation paper out for everybody to to have a look at Great, thanks, Simon. That was actually <laughs> that was actually one of my general questions for the end, which was how are you going to how are you sort of planning on going about um, consultation generally? I suppose not just on not just on the levy. Um, just one really quick question. I know we've got uh, one eye on the time. I think we'll probably run over just by a few minutes if people can hang on for just a few minutes longer. Really quick question on the levy: Have you done any detailed work on crunching numbers on a GDV-based approach to life? Oh, watch this space. <laughs> okay great well that was a far, that was a that was a quick a quick response which is what i wanted really i mean just before we do sort of wrap up um uh, uh, just some 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 timing uh uh, some timing considerations really there's so much in the bill in the policy paper in terms of what you need to bring forward i have i have this i have this notion that you have a really really big office with a huge wall with a huge timetable written on it for all the different <laughs> all the different um bits and pieces of legislation and policy that you have to bring forward and that it must be one of the most co complicated timetables um ever uh, do you have something like that are you able to give us some 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 idea of timing in relation to perhaps some of the larger moving parts. I'm afraid legislation processes are a bit similar to some of your large development schemes where I'm sure you have a large timetable on the wall but equally things move and things happen and things have a, the same degree of precision that um, that we have. So look, um, there are uh, at least three degrees of um, of how, how this works. The first top level is the bill. We have second reading scheduled for Wednesday. Um, so anybody who wants to see um, planning debated in Parliament is due for um, uh, Wednesday. Obviously, it's a levelling up and regeneration bill, so it will cover lots of things, um, but that will take place then. We're then expecting into um, a committee, probably starting this side of the summer recess and probably carrying on into the autumn, then into the House of Lords. My guess is it, bills of this sort of size and scale take a good year to get through Parliament, so that's my rough rule of thumb but well that's sort of that uh, that's the the process and my lesson of doing umpteen bills is that what comes out of parliament won't be exactly what's gone into it at the start so and there's obviously areas such as street votes where the government itself has promised that we will bring forward amendments to to put those in in further so that's the first level the primary legislation and you know there's a process for that the second is the secondary legislation and Obviously, we can't do that until the primary legislation is through. So we're going to we're working out. There's a couple of big bunches of regulation. There's a new set of plan making regulations that we will need. There's the new set of infrastructure levy regulations. There are the environmental outcomes reports, which we haven't really talked about, but which I think is potentially one of the the other big parts of this. And those will need to come forward. But my guess is we're going to want you know good practices to consult on those so my um my expectation is those sort of things will come out after the um after the bill has been through subject to our availability of legal resource to draft those uh, and things um then the third tier is the policy development side of things. So we have talked about publishing a number of consultation papers. Um, the first one has gone uh, live today as I mentioned earlier on compulsory purchase and compensation and value and I you know, there's a. I, I think that is genuinely, together with the measures in the bill, is something which could lead to more homes and more urban regeneration schemes coming forward. Um, so it's really quite an interesting area. Um, we know we have further consultations to do on the infrastructure levy, on environmental outcomes reports, on fees, charges, capability, capacity issues, which I think are really big, big issues and a few others, frankly. Um, there's some changes we're talking about on national infrastructure where I think we need also want to come come out of people. We're just having a bit of a discussion about how we brigade those and how we sequence them through the, the system, but those will all start to come out. I, I would hopefully um, see certainly the majority of those this side of the summer, um, but you know there are a number of uncertainties 
as ever in dealing with um, things in government matters, but that's the sort of plan to help. I think it, we, they're going to be essential to help parliamentarians grapple with how we might use some of these powers of the bill. Um, and I think they will, you know, so I, I do want to sort of emphasize that dual, dual level of interest and in that part of it is to help practitioners, but there's also helping helping parliamentarians understand as we go through the bill. And so those will then come forward into uh, things. The other one, of course, is the national planning policy f framework prospectus and what we're going to need to do. So where I envisage that going, but, you know, this is my my magic whiteboard, is we'll publish something this spring which sets out some of these key questions which have been raised in here it will inevitably not be their last word we will then have to publish a new set of national development management policies and new national planning policy framework in draft after we've been through parliament that will customarily really we consult on those for lots of reasons and then we'll bring bring those forward into force um, after then that one of the other things which I'm really keen that we get public out um, very soon is some of the transitional arrangements, particularly for local plan production. And I'm really keen that we get that that nailed down, agreed and out there as soon as possible so that those who are grappling with plan making at the moment know what way of the line to go for. Because I, I, I think one of the things where I suspect there might be a, a reasonable degree of consensus amongst the plan, panel is that we want plan making under the current system to continue as far as possible, as soon as possible right now. Mita, that's a long answer and I've gone over your timing, but hopefully that sort of answers some of it. No, absolutely. No, that was a brilliant answer. Thank you very much. I wasn't quite expecting that much, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but um, no, absolutely brilliant. And um, yes, we are a little bit over time, but um, I think it's all been absolutely worth it. Um, so, so many more questions, um, including just some, you know, more general questions that, you know, would love to have had time to ask you, Simon, including obviously the R question, which is resourcing. Um, but uh, I think we do need to leave it there, unfortunately. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we might have you back um, on another webinar another day, Simon, as these things um, progress. Um, so with an eye on the clock and, uh, and the panel, uh, this seems like a good place um, to wind up this webinar. So a huge thanks to uh, Catherine and Zach and Simon R. And of course, um, an even huger thanks to you, Simon G, uh, for taking the time to um, share your thoughts today and um, also to give us some more information on how these things are going to um, start um, panning out and what we can expect to see um, over the rest of this year. Um, time definitely up. Thanks very much to everybody that's listening in. Uh, lots more to come on the lurb over the coming months and years, but um, for the moment, uh, it's time to sign off. So goodbye and look forward to seeing you um, at our next webinar in due course. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thanks. Thanks everyone.